Welcome to the parody, where we tell up the victims in all our favorite movies. I'm Justine, and today we're looking at Injustice Armageddon, released two weeks before the virus shut us all down in 2020. This is your final Blind Justice arc film. After Boobs and Banks, Redemption, Smurfs, and non snakey Woman, we finally made it to the end. And before we get through this all, this is the actual first episode to have some kind of scripting. Injustice Armageddon is the one that kind of ties up some loose ties in the Blind Justice arc. It shows us what happened after Jason and Clarity got electrocuted by Jeremy last film. And just like Hostage, this one's basically just a slow burner. And like with Hostage, I don't really mind it. Oh yeah, and flustered Jeremy. For the first hour or so, little stuff basically happens. And I'll always take the stuff with Commissioner Baker and his daughter in a heartbeat. I don't know, it's just kind of like they're just so charming with each other. And yeah, it can also get pretty terrifying. Once things start to speed up at the one hour mark, they really speed up. And I really mean that. You can basically count all the kills in this film within the same 30 minute time limit. Endpoint had a key role in this film, from going to co-director to the director. This is partially due to some production problems, because Raven Akira was supposed to direct Injustice Mortal and this film. Although, he only ended up directing Injustice Mortal. He had to helm the rights over the Endpoint after he lost the script. So, Endpoint then rewrote the script and then directed the film. Although they couldn't direct, they did end up being one of the film's producers. The film also looks great, partly attributed to Hulsar Ryan 56 being the co-director. Oh wait, the one hour marks where all the kills start, so let's see that. Most of the kills in this film fall under group kills, and you know what that means, there's gonna be some bodies. Dead bodies are basically like the staple of the Time Eater Cinematic Universe. And no matter the film you're in, there's probably gonna be at least one. Unless if you're the Dark Knight Genesis or Crisis. Oh wait, yeah, I was talking about the kills. So how many people died within only like a half hour of screen time? Let's find out and get to the kills! The movie begins outside of Jason Stone's house. It's nighttime, and both Jason and Sally both seem to be doing fine. Although Jason is a bit stressed, so he has to talk to Sally about it. It's some stuff about it not being easy since they moved to this house in Detroit. Although he already knew that Detroit wasn't that great of a place. They also have a baby on the way, and they did make the move here so he could protect people. It appears he couldn't protect her from that gunshot that just hit her in the head and just killed her, which also spired blood over Jason. Well, tag hard, I bet that was an inappropriate time to get on screen. How about you just get out of here before you get canceled on Twitter? It appears that Jason and Clarity did in fact survive that electrocution from Jeremy last film. Because why would Jason just be awake in this padded room? Jeremy sent them here just so they could be kept safe, I guess? And he congratulates them on pissing off all the business advocates. Although Jason wants to know, WHERE IS SHE?! Oh, Jason, won't you come sit on my lap to know where she is? He also needs Clarity's location, but come on, she's on his left. And she also is alive, just unconscious and paralyzed from the waist down. I think Jeremy's just dead wrong. I mean, she's walking in time, heroes. Jeremy says this is a holding room, just so he can keep an eye on both of them. And also, Jeremy needs his own agenda, which can clearly mean BUSINESS! Jeremy still needs to do his business, so he walks off. Uh, Rachel, what are you doing? Oh, just looking outside? Okay. Rachel asks for her progress, and he already has some stuff that we've seen. Rattle is a big piece of work. He tried to bring Phantom in before he went after her, and they still don't know where Phantom is. Jeremy will ask him for that office incident, and since then, their connections were off. The public went crazy after all that fighting that had happened the day before. And Rachel says that they need someone, and ooh, they holding hands? Mm? Jeremy's obviously flustered <laughs> about that. Although Rachel has to make sure that she jumps his bones later. Commissioner Baker is at his house in Dearborn, Michigan. Dearborn is actually a real place, unlike that first world bank from hostage, and is actually home to the largest proportion of Arab Americans in any other city in the United States. He and his family have settled down from all that stuff in the past and are just trying to live their own lives. And also, damn. 
We're still paying bills, but other than that, they were just loving life here. And then she just shows him the paper from that morning. She's just playing with her food like any normal kid was, and then she's just so sorry, that's fat. But like, other than that, very dynamic is one of the best things about the film. News reporters are just trying to grab the people's attention, making David and Jason look like big villain. Although they are really just heroes. I mean, he did turn around to Clarity's life from villainy. Something three little girls can do with ease. Since Jason defends the woman and Baker defends Jason, somebody's gotta defend him. But don't worry about it, guy. We can continue the film. Somewhere else in the house, he has this has a big amount of things on a cork board, which includes the Remember Cincinnati billboard from the beginning of Hostage. He looks up at his cork board and the look down and just shakes his head. He gets out some important looking files, which might contain some stuff. Might be some things outside. Nat says the green sheet of paper telling him where to go. He tells him that the girls are not safe and that Jason's missing. Oh, it's R. Why'd that zoom in look like something I could do on here with ease? Although that R is probably at his door. He gets worried, grabs a gun, and then just immediately just bolts out that door. But nah, false alarm, there was nothing there, continue your day. We're back at the holding room. Clarity says that she deserved that paralyzation, but you know, that's obviously not true. Clarity asks Jason why he didn't turn her in when he had multiple chances to. Jason says he saw something in Clarity, which Clarity doesn't really seem to understand. Jason had seen hope in Clarity, and you know, also Detroit. Jason tells her to write her own narrative and not to let anyone else do that to her. And that's also why he gave her a second chance. And then that ends with Jason telling her that Jeremy and all of his goons have free run over Ann Arbor. Oh, suck that scientist. He says that being hyper blue is basically bringing a strain on his mental and physical state. And the entire research department is concerned for him. Jeremy, no, don't show me those death images of Cassie again. I don't want to counter a third time. Jeremy's starting to warm up to the Rachel helping out sort of thing. The scientist then says that regulating fluid has been injected for him. Then there's a little chat about Cassie, which quickly ends. Oh, Jeremy, I don't think the audience wants to cry right now. Jeremy's back inside of a transfuser, the thing that had changed his life forever. They all had big aspirations for this company and its future. He does say that the mech suits were a failure, but it did give way to all of this. Emilio promises that this will undo all the damage. David's on a roof in downtown Detroit. And oh boy, should he have brought a jacket with him. Oh wait, Phantom's here to meet him on the roof. Yo, what's up? Phantom doesn't want to kill David right now. He's just only saving it for later. Phantom wants some stuff from himself and somebody else. That other person ends up being Nia Simone, aka Rattle. Reminder that the Rattle Part 1 episode is coming out on October 8th. Phantom and Rattle both want David, so Phantom tells David to ease his mind. First off, he gets sent to his fears, with number one being the Gravestone. First of all is his longtime partner Jason Stone, who would hypothetically be turning 40 this year. David begs that it isn't real, and yep, you're right, it ain't real. But it will be unless he doesn't take immediate action. Next up is our vulgar SCP station. Revert to complete transfusion and uh Yeah, I won't count anybody here. Phantom says that this woman will create an army in replicas of Jeremy and Phantom himself. Around here is when I dropped off last time, but nope, I'm still going this time. David questions the pronoun in use. That pronoun belongs to Rachel Maybell, who is sure to be banned from Wisconsin schools. The memories that Phantom is showing to David are just nightmares to rattle, but to him and other humans, it may well be their future. Phantom says that the human species is prone of, yet has so much potential and it would be a catastrophe to watch the x-ray regime take control. He says that the power corrupts and something he's all too familiar with, that being the kingpin. Here's something I forgot to do in the Blind Justice re-recount. Show the kingpin's kill graphics. And here they are. Are you happy now? I certainly am. Yeah, I believe the kingpin was the last kill in Blind Justice, but he certainly wasn't the last of all of these powerful money makers. Over in the distance, he sees a hallucination of his child, Gracie. 
he walks over to his little girl, hoping that he'll get some good things out of it. But yeah, let's see how that ages. Oh, what the fuck? Oh man, David's reaction was basically the same to mine. David asks what that basically fucked up horror picture was, and Phantom just replies with the truth. Rattle would explain more thoroughly, but she can't speak right now. Phantom took over in a, a hoeing you to the dead possibilities of a man. And Phantom then gives a brief description to Twitter. Phantom then says that Rachel is a fright and that she must be disposed of. Alright Phantom, is that all you got? See you later G. We're back to the holding room that Jeremy put Jason and Clarity in. And it seems he's back to his regular human self. Jason and Clarity say, what's up bro? Come sit down with us. Jeremy is in complete and utter shock to find out that he isn't hyper blue anymore. And he tries to get out, but sorry bro, that door ain't gonna work. Jason asks Jeremy how it feels to be a human again. And he just tells him to shut the fuck up. In the script for what would be the Injustice Mortal re recount, I had a couple of comedic glow exchanges between Jason and Jeremy. You can read that entire script in the description. Clarity reminds me of the kill I missed in a renegade and says it's only fair. David and Rattle have been on work for these past few uh, hours because, I mean, look at them. They're obviously looking down at that desk. David asks her if that's everything she's got, but she has one more thing up her sleeve. It's an invitation to a celebration event in regards to the corporate merger in between JL Industries and some other company. Hopefully I don't have to add any kills to the count. Do you know how great that would be? He also says it's a good opportunity to sneak in and find Jason and the others. He has the schematics of the event center and with that information they can investigate the building. And also that leaves the JL Industries building vulnerable. He says if she hangs up those BSODs, maybe they'll let them on the force. And it is very much solid evidence as displayed in black and white. He tells us some stuff that we do already know, but it's nice to hear again. And with all that, he doesn't like how it's looking. And if she successfully recreates a transfuser, she could make another hyper blue. But she's already completed it. Phantom is not fond of the idea of him and other Jeremy powered beings with each other. So he had previously spoken. So they must eliminate Rachel through additional methods rather than a traditional killing. So come on y'all guys, can y'all literally stop talking so I can get my fingers ready? Oh hey Grace, what are you doing over here at this time of night? Apparently she's awake because she had a nightmare, so he wants him to put her back to sleep. Uh oh, it's the television guy, get him out bro. Grace says that she wants to help too, but um, yeah, she can help. Just warn her about all the blood. And like I said earlier, their relationship is one of my favorite parts of the film. All right guys, get over there and stop having those two minute love conversations. Yeah, it's supposed to teach kids about sex. If they're gonna find Jason, they better start with this place and the event center. And if her map is correct, the warehouse will be the best point of entry. With this mission, David turns from Commissioner Baker to Vigilante Baker. I don't know about y'all guys, but my fingers are ready, ready to count. The first full thing we see when we get back to the padded room is Blind Justice trying to wake up Jeremy. And I think he's uh, awake. Jason needs Jeremy to listen to him since the only way they can get out of here is through each other. Even though Jeremy hates them and they hate him, they're gonna have to get out of here together anyways. Since Clarity is paralyzed and he's blind, he's gonna have to do all the work. And he's still Jeremy Lewis and this is his building and they can help him get out of here. Jason has a plan but it depends on Jeremy's answering. But are they really with each other if he tried to defend his livelihood? The only thing he has left is his company, which is his family's legacy. He then tells Jason they're just locked up by animals, eating scraps out bowls and drinking water from pipes. Jason falls in and tells Jeremy that he's right. Jeremy even goes as far as to push Clarity's do not interact even further. Jeremy guarantees that she's filled up twice as many graveyards as he has in the past year. Jason tells him to look at the bigger picture and asks them, do you want to die in this room? Because after this, he says that they won't have to see each other ever again, but they gotta work together for now. Jeremy joins their side on one condition, that he never sees them in this city again. 
Ah, uh, Jeremy, do you even know what happens in Time Heroes? They see that some water is dripping out of that pipe there. He says there's a leak coming out of them, and uh, hey, doesn't Rachel want them alive? Yes, they need to be used as leverage against Rattle. Planning begins! Since the pipes have a leak in them and water is dripping out, if they can cause damage to the pipes, it'll flood the room. Then the guards outside will have to be alerted, and they'll have no choice but to evacuate them from the room until the issue gets fixed. Jeremy just says they'll transport them to another room, however. However, Jason just says they'll fight their way out, but... You know, Jeremy doesn't know how we're supposed to do that since he's blind and, and uh, Clarity's paralyzed. Jason says that he can get their guns and give it the Clarity. So she'll be the eyes and he'll be the legs. No way, he's planning to add kills to the count. Bam, merger celebration has just begun. Everybody's just having a good old time, especially everybody over there. Mayor Hardy does have to say that Rachel does know how to throw a party. Yeah, party conversations are really great and charming. However, there is one weird lurker over there. Not around the bend, but like, you know, just a general weird lurker. He's left the ballroom, now he's in the warehouse, and I guess a dude has to tell her that she doesn't have to attract attention to herself. Dives asks the guards on duty where the restroom is. David tells the Phantom that he's making his way through the building, so he asks Phantom for any updates. Oh my god, they actually got the pipes leaking. Okay, so those guards better make their way over here. Uh, you'll have a job to do, okay? The second guard tells Control that they're experiencing some flooding in holding room one, so they have to ditch patch someone to take care of it. The guards outside are working on opening the door, so you know what? I'd say if your plans get the first kills on the count is going pretty well. Phantom, what the fuck? I thought you were gonna save those kills for Jeremy. Over here, I can see four bodies. That one's still alive, but we're not gonna be alive longer. Phantom says that he would have been deceiving himself if he didn't enjoy it, so their obsession at times excites him. He asks the last alive guard where he shall find Jeremy, but you know, boom, we're right there. For those who want to know, I'm not going to add that last guard to the count. They aren't explicitly killed, although it is implied. Clarity needs some help, so Jason enlists some more help. So, yeah, they better get these guys out of the room. The second guard asks Jason where Mr. Lewis is, but he doesn't know. Oh man, what's over there? Oh, that's Jeremy. Jason wastes no time strangling this guard in a disturbing way. This other guard looks behind them, only to get shot by Clarity. His body falls in front of Jeremy. Jeremy tells him to grab the guns and get Clarity up because they're about to head out of his place. Rachel then gives out a speech at the celebration. Rachel starts it off by saying how hard things have been. Rachel then says her siblings were in the Midwest when the invasion happens, but they didn't make it through. I'm also choosing not to put Rachel's siblings on the count since, you know, we didn't meet them. And Rachel throws out a fib live on camera. Over in the halls, the key three are trying to get the kills rolling. Look, they've even got in a single soldier dead. Jeremy adds one more kill to his count, a soldier that gets shot in the head. Clarity tells Jason to, you know, take a 180 and step to your left. And to get out of there, they'll have to shoot at the soldiers, in which they take care of these soldiers pretty quickly. So far, Rachel is still telling her lies that it's delivered, with all the other subdivisions with developed technology and weaponry far beyond what they believed possible only a few years back. Meanwhile, Rattle's back here being like, are y'all believing this shit? Like, really? Mr. Baker is down to the storage room where he sees a sword. Is this gonna be in the post credit scene again? Over the vet, he just sees a lot of workers, guards, and crates. The guard then says, like, yeah, we got our situation back at jail, but, you know, he tries to tell her to Rattle, but then some guy spots him. Rachel says that times have changed and that they're not at war with each other anymore, so they better take a step forward. This place's security guards get super sus a rattle. I mean, seriously, they must have tied her to the guy they spotted downstairs. The guard asks her to comply, and, you know, they need to ask her a few questions, but you know what? She won't comply. You know what? Your only punishment is just getting, you know, thrown to the ground. Oh, shit. I don't care what the fuck y'all say. I'm counting that. Look, he has a gun. Go into your running animations. Meanwhile, Rattle just fucking body slams that guy. 
Mayor Hardy gets himself into another panic like he did back in Detroit, and you know what? They are furious. The guy gets back up, but he only gets a sword to his head. Rattle does his goofy-ass running animation, only just to impale a guy with a sword. Rachel tells Emilio to get the others out of here, so she'll handle this. While running down the halls, this is a scene that hit a roadblock. Eight soldiers laid out in front of him. They tell them that they still have a chance of making it alive, but I don't know if that's exactly right for them. Because they get stopped by a sudden blackout. They then spot Phantom above them, and then they open fire. Hey, uh, guys, I don't know if that was the wisest idea, especially considering that he gets the full-on electrocution mode and kills all eight of them. This can kind of be confirmed due to the fact that we see a single burnt body. Jeremy asks Phantom how they found it, them, but, you know, come on, you gotta act like a big man in this situation. And also, David and Rattle are in a dire situation. Over at the event center, we can see four more bodies that I think I have yet to count. It's rough, but I think I got it correct. Apparently, this is the first time Rachel has seen Rattle in action, but, you know, she knows why she came here. She does get it correct because she figured that they would be looking for them, but she'd be there just waiting. She knows about the roof. Top and the way she protected them against Jeremy, they obviously have some sort of attachment to them. You know, Rattle, this could just be the perfect chance to kill her. But Rachel thinks that she won't be able to find them anyways. But, you know, then Rattle just all of a sudden turns blue. We get some transformation stuff and, uh, um, Rachel? What's happened to you? I'm sorry, what? She's green. She's literally green. I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry, what? What's all this all of a sudden? I'm sorry, what? We haven't seen this with Rachel. Wait, now she's Shocker? Guys, I think I might just be going to say, but like, what? I, I think I might just be seeing things. If Rada wanted to fight, well, uh, well, here Rachel is, as she's now a Shocker, but... And the fight soon begins. Punches are thrown and swords do not go into bodies. She had to become a shocker just to stop her, and then she just electrocutes her across the entire event center. It appears she still has some strength to get up, but I don't think that strength's gonna last all that long. Oh, no way. Now the fight can actually begin. Well, she dodges all those sword strikes, even in slow motion, but it appears she can get more in. Oh, she just got a full-on blow on her. She seems to be enjoying that too. It also causes the lights downstairs to go, which causes Commissioner Baker to get a punch on that guy. Every guard found there is a shooting at David, so he has to take cover, but, you know, Phantom can at least try to protect him here. I mean, you know, like, come on, he can at least do that, and I mean, well, he does get one confirmed kill. The fight in the event center is still going on. Shocker says that the world is vulnerable and especially the freaks like her. So, you know what? She says that she's what the world needs. But her? Like, nah. Nah. She should have died with her mother years ago. No, I don't put that in her mind! I guess she joined the clarity in the do not interact thing. Phantom comes down there and says, what's the big deal about all this? And, oh, you know what? She's gone. I mean, she's down in the corner. Like, come on, what else do you want me to do? Apparently, David called him a fucking bomb threat. So, you know, the police should have the place surrounded. He's glad that David saved them. I mean, the papers were saying that Jason and Clarity were dead. But, you know, especially towards the one that was a vigilante. But, you know, his eyes would be gone. Jason says that he's always been blind, even though he could see him hostage and he got blinded in blind justice. And oh yeah, Clarity is also paralyzed. And also, you know, what about Hyper Blue? Um, uh, David, he's uh, right there. Jeremy says that Hyper Blue is long gone, but he can bet his ass at eight feet. Other things that matter right now are Rattle's unconscious state. When asked what happened, Phantom just says that he saw death in its purest form. Phantom says that Rachel is not what he initially believed her to be, and, you know, she's transformed. When asked about her current location, Phantom says that Rachel's whereabouts are beyond his knowledge. Jeremy then says that it makes sense now, because of the transfuser. The problem with this is, is that Rachel had drugged him and just put him in the transfuser machine, and his powers were drained. And, you know, she dumped him there, but 
knowing Rattle would come for them. He says he had fell for it, but who knows what she's going to do next. Jason thinks fast and says that they need a place to operate. And, you know, Rachel wanted to find them for a bit. Jeremy thinks about teams, but says, nah, it isn't. I mean, free outlaws and free supers, like... Bro, that's just a storm waiting to happen. All Jason knows is that they're free and that Rattle will come and hunt them down. Just hunt them down like dogs, but they have to do something about that. Jason says that with whatever she's got planned, they're the only ones who can stop her. So then stop her then, the audience ain't gonna stop you. But you know, Rachel could stop them, so. Jeremy says he knows a place where they can operate. Arbor County Jail, continuing the time here's tradition of making up places. I mean, other films do that too, like Halloween, Friday the 13th, whatever else, but like, you know, this franchise has so many instances of that. Clarity tries to say that, you know, this person might be one of the secret laboratories, but David actually says that it's a prison and like, you know, it's abandoned. So then it wouldn't be a suspicious place for Rachel to look. But also, uh, he locked himself up in there, so might be kind of suspicious. David kind of agrees with that because, like, could have picked a laboratory, but I mean, you know, that would have been more obvious, so yeah. I guess we're sticking with this place. And also, like, you know, Phantom still has his powers, so he better search for a power grid around this place, so he has to get to it. But also, like, how did David even get up into all this? I mean, didn't he, like, retire? But, like, you know, Rattle's been hunting down for Rachel and X-Ray, and, like, you know, he probably, like, joined him. Like, also, you know, the jail industries attack, the assault on Eric, and, I mean, like, you know, Rattle's always been there, so, like... Waiting for Rachel to slip up, so I don't. He, Jeremy doesn't even know what her problem is in the company, and like you know, what did he do to make her so mad? Like, but like, Rattle won't go into detail. And from David's research, Rachel's company is just as innocent as her. I mean, that Ann Arbor incident was kind of insane. And also, plus, old projects have been uncovered. Child soldiers, like, children with abilities like his, and also, like, Rattle. And he does not want Grace to go for all that stuff, so uh, I can respect it. Well, for starters, they can get the obvious out of the way. She wants power, and she wants the power to recreate the SCP genetic enhancement program. And, you know, Vic just lock her up for good. He says she's not afraid to get dirty to get what she wants. So maybe they can use that against her. And also, like, they could break her. Uh, hey, Jeremy, is it not what you wanted in here? A whole bunch of light? The next morning, he, call, he calls Ash and says, the, like, they found Jason. He's okay. And, you know, thank God. But they end some real shit. And also, Blizz, they got Rattle and Phantom and Hyper Blue with them, so, you know, they'll be okay. Oh, wait, go back. So, Hyper Blue? Didn't that guy kill, like, all those people, like, back there? And also, damn. She says that he can't give her any of that police work BS because, you know, it's suicide. Those guys are dangerous, and, you know, he, he needs to come back home. Grace needs her father to be alive. Just let those police guys handle this. But, you know, David promises I'll be home safe, so, okay? Jeremy thinks David might want to hear this stuff. I'll just play the entire scene here. Now, did they seriously just call Rebel a terrorist? Clarity also adds on saying that she had user bashmers and, and also like terrorists. I mean, come on. They need to find out what she did. And also, if Jeremy did go to the authorities about the kidnapping, who would believe him? But like, it's worth the risk and it may be her best shot. David agrees with Jason because like they really want to compromise their position over like hers. Like, seriously, that'd be kind of dumb and also plus they gotta do that in a way that clears their name too unless you like being a criminal david's best shot opinion is to play that at her own game but what's their plan if they die first well uh yeah they'll have to deal with her new alter ego but even though phantom himself said that she was powerful if 
I'm a good stopper, but what difference can it make a second time? The first time they caught them all off guard. Okay. Even though it is a risky experiment to get them back, feels like he already has some powers. They decide to split into groups. Phantom is in charge of getting whatever Jeremy needs for the experiment and clarity and <laughs> can't do much to moan, but they'll be able to keep an eye on Rachel's moves. And finally, David and Rattle have to keep the pressure on Rachel. He'll explain the meaning in a second, but first, how does he feel about capes? Emilio considers Jeremy's escape a minor setback, although Shocker is just puzzled. I mean, Rattle is dangerous and two vigilantes are on the loose. Wait, how do I even cover this scene with it all being x-ray propaganda? Mitch, however, did find some files missing from the filing system. So, uh, finally a scene I don't have to talk about. Otherwise, it would probably just come up as some um, villain bias. And yeah, even though there are enjoyable ones, I definitely don't want to do it here. The person from Injustice Mortal comes in. And in case if you forgot, her name is Jennifer T Oh no, I, I mean Tiffany. <laughs> if that was the case, there would be some rude fucking dolls hanging around. Jason falls down from a vent in a new costume. Well, he has some questions. Number one, is blind justice capable of murdering two innocent civilians? The answer, yes. Huh, on this answer key, it says the answer is no, you get an F. Although when asked if she believes that he did it, she answers no. I guess you'd get a D then. When asked to show her work, she says, well, he has worked alongside the DPD for a long time and she has seen him in action, but the murders just came out of the blue. And also the no solid evidence of fingerprints, DNA, eyewitnesses, or, you know, other stuff. It makes her think there's more to it. Like, what if it wasn't him? He asks her if she really wants to get to the bottom of this. Basically, just because an entire city wants to know what the, your protector did what he did. And also, Commissioner David did the best he could serve to serve the city justice. And with her letting that slide, that's injustice. She's the commissioner, but... She's still a cop. Jason wants her to hold a press conference in the public tomorrow. After leaving, she's in confusion. And also like, come on, who the frick is that? Oh, he gone. Although she has to see this thing. I mean, fires everywhere. Officer one over radio was right. We really are fired over there. And also, you know, bodies. I mean, not shocking. It is a fire after all. Over here, I can count at least six bodies. Four right here, one off screen that goes on screen, and one right there. Two more over there since I already counted one of them. And this crispy little burnt boy spotted by Tiffany, which then goes onto a direct shot onto his skin. When asked who these victims were, we were contracted workers from Rachel's company X-Ray. We were shipping out a lot of items and other stuff and just a bunch of junk, technology and stuff, yeah, like Officer 2 said. Some of the things being shipped, however, were alien weapons. Apparently this was another mass killing caused by Phantom, the third one in a row. Man, look at Phantom standing there, that shark goes, oh my god, we're back! For those of you who don't know what this place is, since I glossed over it entirely, well, it's basically the planet where uh, Phantom killed those six people, where we learned about the sword and some other stuff. If you want that other stuff, well, gloss over Phantom articles or watch the movie. Here is the location of our introduction to Behemoth. In the Blind Justice arc, at least. Apparently, Clarity didn't know that Jeremy was so talented. But does he really have to go back to be hybrid blue? But, like, like we need to find another way to take her down with him? But... I uh, guess not. He used to use other people's opinions of them as himself, but he glossed back over and said, nah, just get the redemption in. And as of now, the world could use Hyper Blue, not with someone like Rachel on the loose. Then he decides to right his wrongs, and it starts with them too. Clary looked at damn boxes. The boxes behind are a property of the Enagrium Society. Apparently, Frederick Marshall is sponsored by JL Industries before takeover happens, so. 
you know, including his prosthetics department after he died. All of that was given to JL. This means that Jason can see again. The fire's death tolls are racking in at about 21 men. This might be related to the fire with 13 more bodies we didn't know of, but I'm not counting those. We didn't see them. And Ann Arbor peoples have had it with these superpower beings and the garbage vigilantes. And also, yeah, all of that stuff that happened. Then Tiffany gives out her public presentation. There's also sightings of vigilantes in the streets, and that one is blind justice. Blasphemy! But anything is possible with Shocker! Alright, Rachel, I think you're getting a bit too insane here, because you've been acting a bit funny. Emilio, shut the fuck up, you stupid bitch. Jermaine, bro, I I've gotten them all on me! We will work these companies back to dominance, you hear me? Jeez, Rachel, calm down. Guards, get this stupid ass man out of here. Damn, I guess I was the stupid ass idiot thinking David was Jason. Y'all had me fooled because it's basically all the time that Jason is blind justice. But he ain't ready quite yet. I mean, they're going up against aliens and beings with godlike abilities. He just wants to see his girls smile for one last time and just restore all the morals for this world. So then he actually does go back home. His daughter's the first one who senses his presence. But apparently they just got x-ray soldiers set at their house. David, if I were you, I would just finish that what the fuck and just started beating them all to death violently in front of your wife and kid. Eh, just a suggestion, David. Apparently Shocker found his exact coordinates. Jeremy's built a lot of things in his life through jail, but that, I mean, that has to be one of his favorites. Now he's gotta hop in, I mean, it's the only way to defeat Rachel and stuff. Well, uh, not exactly, however. It contains enough volts to kill a regular person, but he ain't human, so... This makeshift transfuser shall do the job. But if Rachel can learn from his mistakes and make a fully functioning one, he can too. So, no, better get in that boy. But one problem, where's Phantom? And yet again, they do not know. And also, David's gone. And it's all because of that stupid little motherfucker named Rachel. He knows this because he somehow managed to get in contact with Shocker over the radio. Christ, I'm just waiting for this one not to be longer than hostage. Come to the crater then. Planning occurs, and they get to that crater two minutes later. You know what, guys? I'm glad there's only 20 minutes left until credits at this point point because this episode is getting me the most it's where we're literally keeping david just bleeding there oh my god it's them in their full costumes let's go Woo! more planning occurs with some flanking and then clearly just talked about how detroit needs them so yeah everybody better be glad they're here i mean bro jeremy must have made a deal with the devil when he became hyper below but i mean bro isn't this just more <gasps> Stay with me now. Rachel me Bill propaganda! And even further along those lines, SCP propaganda! And then they get into another fight. Way too much cool stuff to talk about. If this episode becomes longer than hostage, well, boy am I glad because I get to talk about this cool fight scene. So you see, Clarity's in charge of getting the other two and David out. Rachel spots her and just blows a big wave of green electric cues and stuff at Clarity, but you know, that probably wasn't that much of success. I mean, rattles up and fighting you, so yeah, get to the fight scene already! Woo! Wait, what the fuck is this? I mean, Grace, it's uh, obvious that she's a hurt. All that matters is that she's still alive. Yo, nice job, Bernie. You're just summarizing it all for me. This causes Jeremy to get in his transfuser machine and actually have a pretty cool transformation into the one and only hyper blue you see now this this is what i wanted like bro the fight scenes are awesome they then fly up into the air near that current where they just have uh going away from each other oh uh, all right i guess i can take that and uh shocker speaking interrupting the uh fight Nah, that's not what I wanted. I wanted the fight. Yeah, you see, that's what I'm talking about. Give me that fighting. So, what, y'all are gonna fight now? Um, I only have like uh, four minutes left to spare until this is undoubtedly longer. But, oh, let's go. 
Let's go to get fighting. Oh, and Rattle sends a sword for her stomach. Oh my god. Number one for all. Man, that's awesome. Then it's just the electrocution fair that might be going a bit crazy. Man, that fight got so crazy, you got the police right outside the crater. And, oh, oh my god. Did they seriously cause an explosion? Oh, okay, no. Like, uh, how do I talk about the rest of this fight without making this video longer? David and some dudes from the fire farm are just walking up, and oh, oh my god. Finally get, like, a break from the fight. I thought that wouldn't have happened, but okay. Rachel has had enough of all of the games from all of them. Oh, uh, Rattle, did someone call you down here? I guess Rachel just all of a sudden just grew up a fear. And, uh, like, how did he get? I mean, oh. Yeah, he's the one who started this, so... You know what, Rachel? How did you forget? I mean... Oh, she's finishing it? Okay, getting the more fights. Like, uh, dude, these, uh, fights are cool. And man, this fight goes on for, like, a while, I mean... They're just duking it out. It leaves Rachel injured on a rock with her lights. Oh, nope. Nah. She's just injured. And they're just coming towards you, just... You're just letting them come towards you and get you? It seems like they've caught her. She's gonna go to jail. But then Behemoth enters the scene? Yeah, he's here to explain some lore about some unnatural forces. Now she has to suffer the repercussions. Haha, <laughs> she turned back into Rachel Lull. But Jeremy also senses that this ain't Phantom. But it is. Uh, guys, I think I can feel the movie starting to wrap up at this point. So, boom, we're all back to normal. Group hug! Three months later, a news report comes on. Well, for stars, Amelia and Rachel have been arrested. Ha, <laughs> bye. And also... They've all become divided. Jeremy gives out a public announcement about stuff that, I mean, like, you know, we're basically all monsters inside. And also that science brought him here. I hope he just didn't do anything in RVs in Albuquerque. With Grace, she's just becoming a next blind justice. But no, wait, David's blind justice, ra <laughs> Jason and Clarity have obviously spent a long time in the city, so it's about time for them to leave. And also, Clarity got her passport! Also, before they split, Jason says that he's proud of her. Jeremy looks at his statue, and Phantom is racing up towards the night sky, or in space. There are two post credit scenes, one with a mean drill instructor, and one that has rattle in it. And this is where the movie ends with this arc here revealing that you know you you know the one and only frost is here so we finally made it green things we're featuring in this movie but are there any green things in the numbers graphics nah i don't think so but here's one thing i do need to get to the numbers so uh you know let's get to that 35 people died in Injustice Armageddon, the least of the entire franchise. The victims were all men, giving us this blue circle here. With a runtime of 145 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 4.14 minutes. Instead of giving them our own dedicated sections, I'll just put the awards here. Amethyst Flamethrower goes to the guy who got a sword to his face, and the Broken Pistol will go to the four beginning bodies. So, that's it. Injustice Armageddon came out in 2020, the last Blind Justice arc film. Next up will be Crisis, but until then, I'm not James A. Janice. This has been the parody. God, it's been a while since I said that. Thanks for watching this other insanely long episode. It was just a whole bunch of work for, like, that last 10 minutes or so, so, <laughs> nothing's being longer than Hostage, though, because, you know, that'll always take the lead here, and, uh, well, uh, uh thanks for watching.